So um, we have this uh, generic, highly scalable uh, parallel particles framework that we use for particle and cell uh, simulations, both of hydrodynamics and plasmas, uh, and laser ray tracing, dark matter, and also if we just want to have a Lagrangian information, as uh, Brandt was talking about this morning, of uh, various complicated fluid flows. Um, this code is more than one and a quarter million lines, um, over one million of which are um, executable. And it's in use uh, by many, many groups from around the world. Um, among the things that I'd like to make sure that you know about it is that it scales well uh, from your laptop um, to hundreds of thousands of processors, and it uses a variety of parallelization techniques uh, to be able to work effectively at these large scales, including the threading. Um, Flash is extremely portable, as I mentioned, running from laptops to supercomputers, and right now uh, we're running very large problems, and the ones that I'll be talking to you about are among those problems on the IBM VGP and VGQ at Argonne National Lab. Um, it's comprised of interoperable units and modules. It's completely modular and extensible. When people want to do an application, what they do is pick the, from the menu of physics possibilities and gridding possibilities and so on, and bring those choices into, um, into a directory and then build the code in there. So even though the code is very large, many of the applications don't use uh, as you know, a large fraction of the code. Um, it's professionally managed software with daily automated regression testing on a variety of platforms. Uh, we do that every night. It has version control and um, extensive documentation, including inline, uh, including uh, a user's guide and a developer's guide. So um, with that, what I wanted to do now is to take you to this problem of thermonuclear supernovae. Uh, it's also they're referred to as type 1A supernovae. And so the question is, you know, what are these? So what I've shown you here is um, a, a galaxy, and you'll see a bright point of light come up. Uh, and one of the key things about these thermonuclear power supernovae and all supernovae uh, are they, they outshine their host galaxies. And here I'll show the, how the light curve develops and the spectra. So I'll just run this. And uh, you can see it going through the peak and then declining. Um, I'll do it again. The, the decline from the first peak is really due to the radioactive decay of nickel 56. And the second tail is really due uh, to the radioactive decay of cobalt into stable iron. So um, what makes these uh, supernovae so valuable in uh, astrophysics is that, first of all, um, they're the origin of many of the elements, particularly the iron peak elements uh, that are important and that turned into planets and are also important for life. Uh, but they also are an incredibly important tool for cosmology. It turns out that their peak luminosity is rather similar um, for all, almost all of the events, and therefore they are good at measuring distances in the universe. If you see one of these events go off, that's only uh, a quarter as bright as the, another one, you know that that, that one was, four t or was twice as far away. And so that's how we use it as a cosmic yardstick. Um, the peak luminosities are not that close. They actually, here's showing them before they've been calibrated. Um, what you can see is that there's a range and their peak brightnesses of more than a factor of three, and that's not a, that good a cosmic yardstick. But it turns out, as you can see, that the supernovae with known distances, which nearby supernovae, we know how far away they are, then we can see that if they are dimmer at peak, they decline more rapidly. So there's this correlation that if they're brighter, they're slower in decline, fainter, uh, or not as, not as peak luminosity, they decline more quickly, so that you can actually use that correlation and bring them to a standard template. And if you do that, then the, uh, the scatter is more like 15% instead of a factor of three. And that's what, uh, that accuracy was what led in the late 1990s to dis the discovery, the profound discovery, that the u universe expansion rate, far from slowing down, as had been thought and certainly was happening earlier in the history of the universe, has very recently become accelerating expansion. For the last 
uh, billion years or so. And um, so the explanation for that is really all that we know about it is that it's a property of space-time that has the properties of being anti-gravity. That is, it's repulsive. And so we refer to this as dark energy, and this is one of the most important and profound uh, problems in all of physical science is what exactly is this? And so what we're doing at the University of Chicago's uh, Flash Center is to do the best we can to help better understand these events and by doing so to help observers to be able to make them into more accurate standard candles and so be able to determine more accurately the properties of this dark energy in the hopes of leading eventually to an understanding of it. And there are missions that have been proposed in the U.S. This is uh, the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope is one of them. There's a similar mission that's being proposed in Europe um, with the goal of, one of the goals of these missions is indeed to observe many, many uh, of these thermonuclear powered supernovae and try, try to use them to learn more about dark energy. So what we're doing here um, is using the largest computers in the world to try to better understand these explosions. And uh, we have used computers at a variety of national labs, including Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia, but in recent years, um, we've been using primarily the leadership computing facilities at Argonne National Lab. And right now, uh, we're running on the IB IBM Blue Gene Q there, um, and uh, capstone simulations of thermonuclear power supernova and of a key physical process in them, which is uh, buoyancy-driven turbulent nuclear combustion um, utilize a, a significant fraction of this platform. Um, so I wanted to just take you through the scale of computing that we do and some of the, uh, just a couple of the issues that we face. Um, FLASH was an informal acceptance test for the IBM BGL and a formal one for the P and the Q. Um, it's been fully threaded, which enables it to compute a scale on the BGQ, but I'm here to tell you, regretfully, that is the only current leadership class platform on which it can do so, because it is such an enormously multi-scale, multi-physics code that um, and making it operate on something like Titan for many of these problems is, is really, really difficult. And we're right now in the process, uh, we have, have of pursuing a strategy that we've developed over the last few years as to how to handle this revolution of increasing complexity in architectures. And I'll be honest, our strategy is to punt for three years, but not lose time. How can we do that? What we're doing is we're um, actually taking apart the code and in a new version exposing parallelism and breaking apart the algorithms so that little pieces of data can bring pieces of algorithms to them and so prepare for whatever the heterogeneous architectures and the software, the future, uh, the languages will need us to do. So we're basically trying not to lose time but not to have to place a wager on anything in particular. Um, you've probably read some of these large numbers here. I would just say that currently this year we will use 150 million CPU hours on Mira. That's equivalent to 300 million on Intrepid. And uh, another 20 million uh, for the supernova simulations th through the InSight program. Last year, we generated uh, three petabytes of data, and we're generating a lot more now, so that we have to do intelligent triaging and data compression and so on to be able to handle this data. So what I showed you what a thermonuclear-powered supernova looks like. What's the physics that causes it to happen? So there's four phases or stages here I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I'll be talking to you about what's called the single degenerate model, where there's a white dwarf star, like our sun will become uh, later in its life, in a binary with a normal star, and it's drawing with its gravity hot gas into accretion disk that accretes onto it, building up its mass over a long period of time of the order of hundreds of millions of years. The pressures and temperatures in the center gradually increase, and eventually um, the center is made out of carbon and oxygen. Carbon burning starts to smolder, and there's convection throughout this region. Some place or places here, 
um, that some little fluctuation in density and temperature will lead to a flame igniting. And then it will probably be torn apart and nothing will happen. But eventually, things will reach a state where that, there will be flames that are ignited. We don't know how many, but we know that they have to be in this convective region. So I'll show, talk to you a moment or two later about what happens when there are lesser or more ignition points and whether they're closer or further from the center. So um, following that, uh, then we actually have the ordinary flame phase of turbulent nuclear combustion, and then we have somehow a detonation wave is triggered. Now, prior to the flash center, it was thought that maybe somehow this flame could be torn apart and therefore trigger a detonation. That still may be true, but how that happened is still not known, so in all those simulations, uh, it was put in by hand. What happened is that as we were investigating this, um, we discovered an entirely new uh, explosion mechanism due both to the capabilities of the flash code and the computational resources we were given that enabled us for the first time to do fully three-dimensional simulations. But before I show you uh, a little bit more about that, the two main things I'd like you to take away from this discussion of the physics is it's nuclear energy that powers the explosion. Um, but if that was all that happened, we wouldn't even see these events because they're expanding at 25,000 kilometers a second. And just like a nozzle in your refrigerator freezer, the gas expands and adiabatically cools, this material is expanding and adiabatically cooling, and within hundreds of seconds, it's ice cold. And so it's, it's invisible. So we would not see it. But in the products of the nuclear burning, uh, the combustion are these radioactive nuclei of nickel. And over seven days, they decay into cobalt. And the gamma rays from them heat the ejecta and make it glow, and then the cobalt into iron. So it's the radioactivity that makes them visible and is the entire source of the light that we actually observe from them. So the turbulent nuclear combustion is a key physical process, but it's very, very challenging. The sizes of the stars that we deal with, of course, are the size of the Earth, you know, 2,200, 2,300 kilometers in radius. But at the start, in the core of the star, the nuclear flame is about a millimeter thick. So I was once asked when we started our center and we were proposing for it to DOE, I was asked, do you really need large-scale computations? And I said, well, would you like us to do a direct numerical simulation of this phenomena? That would be great. I said, OK, let's see, 10 to the 12 cubed. OK, all we need is 10 to the 36 grid points. Is that enough for you? So it'll be a long time before we can actually do that. So what we have done is extensive simulations to better understand this physical process. And these simulations typically, the largest capstone ones of them, involve more upwards of beyond 4 billion of grid points. So they're very, very extensive. I'm going to show you a movie about them. And before I do that, I want you to see what you'll be looking for. This is the flame surface, which will become turbulent. Um, this is actually the uh, kinetic energy in the turbulence. And you can see the surface of the flame where it was, became turbulent. And this is the entropy, which tells you something about the energy in it. So I'll go now to the, the, the movie. And what just be prepared. When it starts, you'll start seeing the flame moving upward. But then, because we do it in a very, very tall column that you'll see on the right, um, in fact, um, this will start the camera panning with it. And so um, you'll see that. So here you can see the flame surface becoming turbulent. Um, here is uh, the kinetic energy in the turbulence, and you can see sound waves going up ahead of here, but basically nothing's happening ahead of the flame front. It's the flame front and the buoyancy of it that's driving the burning and creating the turbulence, which increases the surface area of the flame and so increases the rate of burning enormously over what it would be just for the laminar flame speed itself. And you can see here we're going up the column that we've prepared. So this physical process is absolutely key. And from it, we've been able to learn many, many important things. But a few of them I've said here. It turns out that because of the turbulence and the, the complexity of the flame surface, it's not like Kolmogorov turbulence. So it's a much lower burning rate than people had estimated before. 
And we also find that there's one and only one length scale that determines the rate of burning, and that's the length scale. At larger length scales than this, the, the laminar flame speed is high enough to smooth out any little perturbations that might happen. At smaller, time scale, at smaller length scales, it's not. So this really is a key parameter in determining the burning rate. And we also have discovered that the overall changes in the burning rate aren't happening because of changes in the amount of area on small little irregularities. They're happening at the very largest scale. So these insights we're using to actually build a subgrid model that captures all the key physics to use in our large scale simulations. And so what I'm going to show you here is uh, such a simulation. Um, what you'll see is there will be an ignition that occurs just barely off center from the center of the star. And uh, hot material is shown in color and the surface of the star in green. The key thing here is prior to our simulations, people had only been able to run these simulations in 1D or in 2D. In those cases, the only natural, in fact, the only reasonable thing to do is to ignite the star at a point at the center. But because we could do the simulations of the entire star and this whole convective region is what's going on and could be happen anywhere there, then we said, why would we do it at the very center? Let's see what happens otherwise. And so this is what happened. Something, ah, patience. So the ignition happened near the center and like a hot air balloon, this hot, region rose and became turbulently unstable, growing incredibly in surface area and burning quite a lot, and then spreading, popped out, no longer confined, spread over the surface of the star, and collided at the other side, driving an outward jet at 40,000 kilometers a second, and an inward flow into the star, uh, 3 billion degrees in temperature, and to densities that were high enough to just detonate without having to do it artificially by hand. And you saw the detonation wave in a quarter of a second to a half a second sweep through the star. We've just backed up by an order of magnitude and distance so you can see the final uh, expansion of the remnant. So this is sort of the picture of what I'm saying is, and the message here is for us is really the discovery of this model really illustrates the importance of doing high fidelity simulations, in this case in three dimensions, and it of course exemplifies what the kind of scientific discoveries that high performance computing can make possible that aren't really possible in other ways. So I'm going to skip this, but what it just in one sentence says is that um, if you burn more during the ordinary flame phase, you expand the star and the densities are lower in it and you get less of the nickel. So they're going to be um, a dimmer supernovae. Um, and here's the last thing. If you keep going so that you expand it more and more and they become dimmer and dimmer, eventually you get to a point where that detonation doesn't happen. This is a failed uh, gravitational confined detonation model. And we find that it leads to peak luminosities 10 to 100 times lower and with characteristics that are very similar to some very exotic uh, supernovae that have been not explained up till now. Um, just to here at the end tell you that we have partnerships with uh, astronomers with big surveys that are actually uh, observing uh, hundreds of supernovae of this kind for us to use to validate the models. And you can compare our models with individual supernovae and they do pretty well. But as Brandt said, how do we know the, these are typical? So we've formulated a way to do this with large numbers of supernovae that through templates were called data-driven models used by the community and these are the uncertainties that those observed population of supernovae give us. These are um, actually the low luminosity ones that I told you about the failed GCDs and these are the typical ones. So you can see how these lie in the space of observed supernovae and the low luminosity ones here in particular uh, lie outside it. So the validation is a really important part of that and um, just in conclusion here, um, we have extensive simulations of key physical processes in the supernovae. 
um, the thermonuclear powered. We're using the results of these to develop better models. And while the model that we've discovered is not sure it's the, the, the final story, it's extremely promising as a way of, uh, as the explanation of these thermonuclear powered supernovae. And we've done um, a lot of work to try to validate these models as well. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. There is time for a couple of questions. Just explain. And I will, and I will start with, with one small one. So you plan to use roughly 400 million core hours this year. And you're saying you're treading water. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Go ahead. So uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we uh, already have the, the early science, which is 150 million CPUs, we're able to take our studies of this turbulent thermonuclear combustion um, to uh, larger scales and to understand it more. And actually, we've used a, uh, up uh, about 90 million of those hours to date this year. And in the other one, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're expanding what we were doing before, so to not only look, look at this gravitationally confined detonation model that we discovered, but also to look at ones in which there is just uh, this flame stage and nothing else happens, or ones, the old kind of models, which still might be the answer, where you have a flame that then somehow turns into a detonation. More questions? There would also be a panel, so you can ask, ask at that time. Please go ahead. So uh, you've, you've done this uh, simulation. How long did that take, and how many are you planning to do with this 400 million hours over the next year? Right, so um, the, uh, for the early science, um, the typical simulations that are, we, so we do both the highest fidelity simulations we can do, and then intelligently as we can back off from those to do more capacity simulations. We're really into parameter sweeps and uncertainty, understanding uncertainties. Um, and so what the cap, the, the turbulent nuclear combustion ones are typically eight to 12 million CPU hours on, on Mira. Okay, that would have been 16 to 25 on Intrepid. The capstone simulations, you know, are somewhere around 50 to 60 million. Uh, CPU hours, and we actually do very sophisticated things to try to start those in a way from the from the smaller ones to save CPU hours. The supernovae uh, range from 300,000 uh, CPU hours up to 800,000. Occasionally, we do one around 1.2, 1.5 million. Thank you. One more. How much of the times that you just uh, listed is for I.O.? Uh, so the question is how much time? It's very, very little, okay? So uh, I would say uh, when we're, so there's kind of two things. If we're gonna make a movie, we have to do uh, a lot of plot files that are put out. But it, we can do it more, much less frequently if we're actually just doing the simulations for the, the data that we're getting out of it. It's very surprising, but actually what dominates the I.O. are not those plot files, but the files that are very small that we read out of the tracer, Lagrangian tracer particles, that we place 20, 10 to 20 million of them in the star to give us exquisite information about the nuclear uh, nuclei that are produced through different temperature and density histories. And so, uh, those we have to, because the temperatures are changing rapidly in certain parts of the star, we have to put those out very frequently, but it's less than 10% to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, thank you. And thank you very much.